Hello guys, Jonathan here again with a really cool historic firearm to show you. I'm sure, I'm very sure this troubled very few of you in the, um, in the social media side of, of this series. Guessing what this might be, it's pretty clearly a C96 of some sort and it's a carbine. So <laughs> if you said C96 carbine, you were correct. If you added more detail, then great. <laughs> we, we always like people to, uh, to go above and beyond. Reason for choosing this is actually an article that I have recently had published in the journal RMAX. Uh, so a bit more on that in a moment, but that article is about aircrew firearms. Um, so weapons used in the air, in aircraft of the First World War, that are not fixed, well, <laughs> not just that aren't fixed to the aircraft, so something like a pistol or a carbine, obviously very useful in a pinch if you're having to. The classic uh, example are artillery spotting aircraft or reconnaissance aircraft that meet each other in the sky. What are you going to do? You're going to engage uh, the other guy, and the only way to do that at the time was with your sidearm or with whatever you took up. So rifles were used, um, pistols were used, there was a, a crazy guy who had three Webley Fosbury's in a rack. They so say he could pull out one, fire his semi-automatic shots, six shots, pull out the next, so on and so forth. Everyone was trying whatever they could to engage the enemy whilst in the air. Um, so uh, jumping back actually to another, another publication of mine, this is not just a plug, I assure you. Uh, I wrote an Osprey weapon series book on the C-96 in general back in 2017. And if you know the series, you'll know that there are a couple of artworks, double double page artworks in uh, paintings in each book representing a scene from history and the weapon in question. And one of the scenes that I had rep uh, represented was an air to air scene and the German aircraft, uh, Tauber, I believe it was, the Observer has one of these. And some of you are probably already shouting Battlefield 1. And yes, you're right. That's uh, that probably that same incident. Uh, I believe uh, Ewan Rabagliati was was involved from the RFC, um, and incidents like it, and knowledge of these things in existence and being purchased by uh, aircrew. That's inspired Battlefield One, absolutely. So there are actually two versions of the C96 carbine in that uh, game. One of them is the M1917 trench carbine with a detachable box magazine hanging off the bottom here otherwise quite similar. This is not that. This is very close to the aircraft or vehicle weapon <laughs> version or PDW in modern terms that also appears in that game. And we was used um, with, with no specific details of its use, unfortunately. A lot of this stuff isn't documented. That's why I wrote the article trying to pull together everything from the British side that was known about improvised weapons in the air essentially. And there's not that much to it, to be honest. This is a long barreled version of the C96 broom handle, so called, with a wooden forend on it to give you a, a support hand grip. The major change to the pistol version, which I'll remind you of in a moment, is this push button catch here. And you might have noticed that the iconic straight, semi straight broom handle grip is absent essentially cut off the, the forging and you press the catch and you pull off the buttstock with its semi-pistol grip and so this is really a takedown carbine. Um, unlike the conventional C96 which can have its holster attached to the butt to turn it into a sort of ersatz carbine, um, more about that in the Osprey book, um, this is basically unusable if you take off the buttstock. And you can see it's just dovetailed, or rather it's a mortise and tenon, uh, mortise and tenon uh, arrangement cut out there to latch it in place. And you see the other side of the catch there. Very simple setup. I'll just slot that back on because it doesn't look right without the buttstock on it. And that's kind of it. It doesn't have any... Um, Anything more advanced than that? Uh, unlike the Luger carbine that has a an additional forend arrangement here, 
to help accelerate the, the barrel and, and barrel extension back forward again. Uh, this seems to be fine as is, perhaps due to the uh, chamber pressure of the 7.63 mouse cartridge. Um, referring back to Battlefield 1 again, there are the sights on the version in the game are a bit different. Uh, and in fact, they're different in real life as well. We have three of these. We're very fortunate to have three um, relatively early C96 carbines, and they all have different different features. This has a con conventional style rear sight. Um, the one in the game is enlarged. I'm not sure that's a historical configuration. We'll try and show you the sight. And the front sight, well, we have two with conventional blades that are just uh, dovetailed in from the side, um, as is this, but it has a quite a robust uh, sight protector. And the sight inside is not just a blade, it's, a, it's quite a, it's a more precision kind of globe on a stick, as it were, a bit more of a target setup. I've chosen this one partly because it's in, it's in pretty good condition, but it's also very early. So this one is serial numbered on the, um, what's called the Knox form in general, generic terms here, but on the barrel extension, if you like, and on the frame. So all the major uh, assemblies and just below that on the buttstock as well. And 225 is very early. Date-wise, uh, that and the slab-sided um, configuration of the, of, the, of the gun, of the pistol bit, as it were, and the large ring-shaped hammer all puts this at circa 1900. So not quite 1896, but still pretty early. And this is a time when um, Mauser are trying to push the carbine variants, the dedicated carbine variants of the C96, for hunters, target shooters, um, I guess, well, any purpose to which a longer barreled, permanently butt stocked version of the pistol might be desirable. Just to provide reference, we'll show you this on the overhead camera. Here is another circa 1900 conventional broom handle, and you can see the barrel is twice as long, got a more substantial barrel extension as well. And in fact, in detail, it's quite different. Um, this is lacking the additional milling on the rails here. Um, and yeah, there's, there are substantial differences in detail, but they could have started from the same forgings. So you're not um, wasting too much manufacturing time and therefore money. The triggers actually are different as well. This is, a, this is more like a 19th century revolver trigger, interestingly. And I have to assume for the limited production sort of run of, of, of these things that they were you know, they were probably semi-custom in terms of you could order different sites, different configurations to some extent. So in total, uh, we believe only uh, 1,100 of, of the carbines of, of all configurations. I think that includes the, the trench carbine as well, um, were ever made. So really a drop in the ocean in the scheme of things and not very successful. And I think that's, that's down uh, in general terms to the fact that this thing was very flexible as is. You know, stick the holster stock on the back and you've got almost as good a carbine as this. Whereas you take the butt stock off this, you haven't even got a pistol. It's really quite long. It's a, a sort of niche thing. It's going to appeal mainly to, I suppose, hunters of small game. That's the other thing. The pistol cartridge isn't really up to taking out anything very large. Um, and in terms of self-defense, you don't want to be asking the um, attacking criminal or whatever to wait while you assemble your beautiful Gucci uh, pistol carbine. You just whip out your broom handle uh, and go to town. So not ever likely to be a huge hit anyway. As for the use of something like this in the air, well, it's 10, 10 shots as fast as you can pull the trigger, reasonably good sights, uh, reasonably portable and, and handy. It's one of the better options out there. Um, that said, we have no accounts of this downing anything. And overall, these handheld weapons and even sort of improvised um, rifles bolted to the side of cockpits and things, 
Lewis guns firing through the propeller, that kind of thing. None of them were super effective. It, it, we really needed to wait for um, powerful enough engines to, to carry machine guns reliably into the air and give you enough power to actually fight in the air and interrupter gears and at least um, over wing mounts for, for Lewis guns so that you weren't shooting the heck out of your propeller. Um, yeah, so <laughs> not wildly successful, but a really interesting aspect, I think, of uh, First World War history, or certainly firearms history. So um, selfishly, do check out the edition of Armax with my article in it, but also please take a, or keep a lookout for a Kickstarter that they're about to launch um, imminently and that you might want to take part in and, and, and benefit from. Uh, the Armax Journal, I'm biased, I'm associate editor for it, but I, I think it's, it's fantastic. It's uh, scholarly, it's academic, but I, I, hopefully it's accessible as well, well as illustrated. Um, it's the official journal of the Cody Firearms Museum. If you know anything about historic firearms, they are you know, one of the absolute go-to places for that, as I, as I hope we are. Okay, guys, thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed that one. As always, you know where we are hopefully by now with our, our three sites that you can visit if you're in the UK or visiting the UK. Otherwise, our social media, we have Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Um, and I never remember to say this, so do like and subscribe as well. And uh, you can also see me over on the GameSpot channel talking nonsense about guns. But we'll see you again next time on the Royal Armouries channel.